Well, good morning, Grace City. Happy Spring Fling. If you're here for both, you're brave being here this early. But let's, as we enter into God's presence through worship this morning, let's stand. And I just want to encourage you. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're walking through. But our God is more than capable of handling it. And so whatever you have this morning, let's cast those things at his feet this morning. Amen.
I've seen how you work Cause there's so much goodness and grace Much more than I deserve Cause I know who I am And I can stay where I'm at We've come this far by faith I just can't turn back Cause I know who I am He's not done He's not done with me yet There's so much more to the story You're not done with me yet Cause you're not done with me seated. Welcome again to the table. We are so excited for what God is continuing to do in this this series. Uh, we've got some wonderful things that are coming up. Hey, if you are new to Grace City, welcome. Thank you for taking the risk at being with us today. If this is your first time with us, then you are probably not familiar with the seating arrangements, and so we're so grateful that you would be present with us today. We've got a lot of great things happening today. Today is our spring fling, and so it's like our family reunion. So after second service, we're going to gather together for food and all of the, the essential bees. We've got burgers, bounce houses, baptisms, and there's a fourth, a bake sale. Um, there's probably some other bees that I've forgotten about, but some really great things that are happening today. And so come on back at uh, 1230 and uh, be with people. And if you uh, are looking to take a next step of baptism and you haven't registered or told us yet, you can still be part of it today. We're excited for that. So we're going to be headed back to the kitchen after a second service, and we'll talk to you there. Uh, you can even go in the clothes that you're wearing. It does not matter because Jesus adores you. And so we're 
we're really excited to be able to do that today. Uh, the bake sale, uh, Pastor Jace is going to be back there raising funds for Passion Camp. So it costs about $525 to send our middle school and high school students to a week of Passion Camp to connect with Jesus and other students as well. And so you can head back there, find the greatest cookie or pie or cake that you want, and then, you know, bid a couple thousand dollars and take that bad boy home with you and enjoy it. And so we're excited to raise funds for all of the students and send them out. And then next week we have Discover Grace, which is an opportunity for those that are newish or newer to Grace City to learn a little bit more about the history of the church and where we're going and how you can fit into that story. So you can sign up online at wearegrace.city or write that down on your Connect card during services, hand that in afterwards as well, or go to the welcome tent and ask other questions about that. But that's on the 21st after second service, about an hour long, we'll feed you lunch as well. And then we have Serve Day coming up on May 4th, and that's a perfect time for you to get sweaty with other Grace City fam and be part of some projects that are on property here. It's from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., so you can sign up online or in the Connect card as well. And then we've got another service opportunity too, which is really, really cool. We've been uh, partnering with Nathaniel's Hope and providing Buddy Break every month for our special needs friends, and so we're we'll gonna be headed out for some of us to Lake Eola that day for some serving of our special special needs friends throughout the community. So thousands of people will be out there too. So if you want to help with that, instead, you can sign up online as well or find Tracy Ahern. And then one last thing, uh, we have GC Sports. And so, hey, can you give, it, uh, give up a hand for uh, the whole crew that's been providing that this, this season? It's been an awesome opportunity to meet people with that. Uh, we're going to be going into our second season starting May 2nd, which is flag football. Holla! And cheer as well. And so if you want to be part of that, you can connect with us afterwards or you can go online as soon as tomorrow to be able to register. It's $30 for each participant because we want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to be part of that. But hey, in the meantime, just stay seated where you're at because we've got something special coming up. Hey there. Good morning, everybody. It is so, so good to be with you this morning. And yes, the room is set up a little different these couple weeks. And can I, honest, can I be honest with you? I totally love it. Um, I, it's funny because watching uh, everybody the last couple weeks, you can see different responses and hear different responses trickle in. Um, I've heard some people say like, hey, we should do this all the time. And I've heard other people like, make it stop. <laughs> and I just want to disappoint everybody, neither. Um, <laughs> for these next couple of weeks, we'll be doing this. Um, and then, um, it, but it was intentional. This, this space is intentional. We wanted to create a different kind of environment these couple of weeks, even coming after Easter. Talking about what does it mean uh, to be a church, to be a community of faith. And honestly, even this room, um, I love the closeness in the way we're set up right now. Uh, this isn't my notes or anything. I was just thinking about it this week. Um, uh, it reminds me of... Uh, being in living rooms uh, with friends and, and sing songs of worship and it's a little messier and just close together. And um, it reminds me of uh, student ministry years ago uh, in a basement in this church with like, you know how you always stick the students like in the basement in most churches or like the moldy thing in the back of the property is usually where you stick the students. Well, our youth ministry was in the basement and um, there'd be times of worship where there was no platform or or a crowd. It was just all kinds of a mess, and you're just together singing songs. There's like three songs on the set list, but you just keep singing and celebrating um, and watching these students connect because they love Jesus. And um, so it gives me all those kind of uh, feels. And it also, um, it's a different vantage point. Um, I get to see people or see faces in different ways than I usually do. And um, I got called out. I was actually um, texting my, my sweet bride for a second, and my friend Katie's like, hey, stop texting in church. Um, 
Um, but last week, I noticed, and my, my buddy Pastor Thomas um, pointed out, um, I got to, while we were singing, um, my friend Jane over here caught my eye. And, and I'm going to point her out just for a second because I love Miss Jane. And if you don't know Miss Jane, she's amazing. Um, she's my, yeah. Oh, I should have thrown a picture up. Um, she uh, uh, and I ride together on our way to senior lunch once a month. They let me, you know, tag along since I'm only like three years under the limit. Um, <laughs> Uh, but last week I was just watching, and actually Thomas pointed out to me, I'm looking over at Miss Jane, Miss Jane has her walker, which is usually decked out pretty sweet, um, and so she stays seated during worship, but she had both of her hands up, and she was just singing her songs about Jesus that she loves, and it was one of those, like, moments for me where I stepped back, and I'm like, man, Miss Jane actually probably has a lot that she could teach us about worship, and it just kind of caught me, so thank you, and thanks for always being, like, front row um, no matter how the room is set up, you want to be up close and personal. So um, we started the series last week, The Table, and um, looking at these meal stories that Jesus, uh, about Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. And Luke has a ton of, like the whole Gospel of Luke seems like this is a recurrent theme of the table. The whole story of the Gospel um, and the life of the believers told through the table. Uh, and here's a, Scott Barchi said this, it would be just understanding what this would have meant in this time period. It'd be difficult to overestimate the importance of table fellowship in Jesus' time. Like you could not overemphasize how important this was. Mealtimes were far more than just uh, occasions for individuals to consume nourishment. Um, it's not just food. It's not just fast food run through a drive through Being welcomed at a table and eating food together with another person has become, or had become a ceremony richly symbolic of friendship and intimacy and unity. You slow down and enjoy. You're not just enjoying the food, but you're enjoying each other's company. And I said this last week, the Gospel of Luke, and, and really for Jesus, meals, uh, meals are opportunities. And wouldn't it be cool if we saw meals this way? If we just kind of reset and just like started looking at meals this way, and what a cool thing, if, if our, even as a church family, if we start thinking through this lens, that meals are opportunities for healing, healing relationships and hospitality and fellowship and celebration and worship. Meal is actually a, a place of worship and uh, receiving forgiveness and honest conversations and confrontation and reconciliation and even rev revelation, learning something um, about God together in the context of those meals. And so we talked last week uh, in Luke chapter 5. We'll be in Luke chapter 7 today. If you want to follow along, it'll be up on the screen. It's also in your worship guide. And we talked about in Luke chapter 5, this first meal that Jesus has is with a guy named Levi, or later we know him as Matthew. He's a tax collector. And Jesus, it's crazy, Jesus uh, has a meal with this, this outcast uh, this guy that would be considered a traitor to their own kind. He was, um, it, it, there was so much hatred towards the tax collectors. They weren't even allowed to gather in and worship. And Jesus says, hey, let's go have lunch. We're going to go eat and share a meal together. And Jesus, you see just a couple of verses later in Luke 5, he's gathered around and he's having a meal with tax collectors and sinners. And sinners uh, in that context would have meant everything from like prostitutes um, or eunuchs, people that had been... Um, had their parts altered. Um, any, it, like those kind of just outcast of society, because those are the only friends that Matthew had, that Luke had, and they're, or, uh, Levi had, excuse me, and they're gathered around, and Jesus is sharing a meal. And Jesus even invites fishermen and zealots, like the, the far right wing and the far left wing, he gathers them at the table uh, to come and share a meal together. You've got uh, Simon the zealot, and you've got Matthew the tax collector, and you've got James and John, these fishermen. Uh, just simple blue collar guys. You even have a guy named Judas. And um, uh, if you're ever wondering at the Last Supper who Jesus was sitting next to, we actually know from Scripture. Uh, on one side, it was John. John was leaning against him. And then on the other side, and they would be reclined, on the other side was actually Judas Iscariot. It says that, that he dipped from the same bowl. And, and so Jesus is sitting right there, and it's even sharing a meal with somebody that he knows will end up betraying him. And that just blew my mind as we marched through Lent and Good Friday and Monday Thursday together. And, but this is what meals do. And so um, the question somebody posed to me last week, um, a good friend, and this was a, 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 somebody that loves God. I know this person. I know their heart. Um, I absolutely trust them. But here's the question that they posed to me last week after the service. And I wanted to address it real quick. And here's the question. How do, how do I love someone without affirming their lifestyle? 
Now that's a pin drop moment. Everybody's like, how do I love somebody without affirming their lifestyle? Um, you can guess what maybe that's in reference to, but, but, but it's, a, it's a pretty fascinating question. How do I love someone without? And so I thought about it, and my first thing, my first response was, well, how do you see Jesus responding to this, to this question? How does Jesus respond to this question? Um, and I want to give you one thing that Jesus said that has actually helped me a lot. Um, because really, actually, if you're going to take this question, you look at, like, what's the question behind the question? So I want to give you um, another scripture that Jesus says that I think it helps clarify. And then I, I'm going to offer what I think is an even better question. At least it's the question I want to ask myself regularly, okay? Um, so here's, here's, how do I love someone without affirming their lifestyle is often, like, the question behind the question is really, like, don't I need to tell them that they're wrong? Like, like don't I need to let them know that? Now, my experience in that, I'm just, I'm just being honest, my experience in that is that I found very few people, save my children, um, that, that really need me to, to tell them that they're wrong. Maybe, maybe there's time. But, but there are times. But here's the scripture. Here's what Jesus says. This is, this is a fascinating thing. Matthew uh, chapter 7. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, says, Jesus says this. Don't give do- uh, to dogs what is sacred, Don't throw your pearls to pigs or swine. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now keep in mind, Jesus has just talked about things like adultery and hatred and murder. He's talked about like all these really heavy, like um, coveting and being, he's talked about some really big, heavy things over the previous couple chapters in the Sermon on the Mount. And then he throws this one in. And if you're reading this literally, you're like, I've never been tempted to do that. I don't know about you. I don't have a pet pig. You might have a pet pig. I don't know if they have a whole lot of like, things to do with pearls. Maybe they do. Um, maybe I'm just completely ignorant, but, but you can probably guess that there's something more going on there, right? What is Jesus saying? What Jesus is saying is don't throw, don't give something. You, what you have, that may be a great truth, but if somebody's not ready for it, all you're going to do is they're going to choke on it and it's going to cause even more problem and more separation with you. And you say, well, who said that? Jesus. Jesus says, okay, you've got the truth, right? Like, and he's just talked about some heavy stuff. Adultery, marriage. Um, he's talked about, uh, like I said, hatred and anger and, and murder. He's talked about some, some big stuff in just the previous uh, he's talked about lust. He's talked about, um, and, and then he says this, he's like, well, as you're, as you're doing this, and, and right before this in chapter seven, it opens up with Jesus talking about judging others. Don't judge. Check out what's in your own eyes first. And then he throws this in, that don't, here's the temptation. It's like, well, I have to tell them that. And Jesus says, hold on, before you do, if they're not ready to hear it, they're gonna choke on it, and they're going to turn and attack you. And it's not going to help them any closer to, to the kingdom or to experiencing grace. So, so you're like, well, don't, maybe. And say, well, how do I know if it's time to tell them? For me, most of the time, I just wait till they ask. I mean, just honestly. Somebody says, hey, what do you think about them? I'm like, if you want me to be honest, and I, and I love you enough to be honest, I love you, um, here's what I really think about that doesn't change, like, that, that's it. And whatever the, the discussion is, that's usually the way I approach it. Um, but I want to go to, we're going to be in Luke chapter 7. We're going to pick it up in 36, but I want to back even two verses before 36. And this is really where last week kind of ended, is that Jesus says in Luke 7, or excuse me, Luke says, Luke seven thirty four. Jesus is talking again here, and Jesus says about himself, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And you guys all say about me, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. This is fascinating. Jesus is talking to the religious people around, um, the Pharisees, and, and he says, okay, you guys call me. You've given me the reputation that I'm a what? I'm a friend of tax collectors and sinners. My reputation is that you guys talk about me, Jesus says, and that I am a friend of tax collectors, the outcast that you don't even let in worship, that I'm a friend of sinners, like prostitutes and eunuchs. Like, I'm a friend of those people. And, it's, and it's, he's been there having meals with them, right? So it's, he's not just saying it. 
And here's my observation with it, is that Jesus never seemed to worry at all about whether he was perceived um, affirming the lifestyle of tax collectors or prostitutes or anything. He didn't seem concerned with that question at all. Jesus just loved them, ate with them, and died for them. Was he ever afraid of telling the truth? No. But he loved them, he ate with them, and he died for them. And even when we sometimes look at the pastor, it's like, well, didn't he tell them, go and sin no more? I want to be like Jesus. And for me, I hear the passage in, in John chapter about go and sin no more, and I'm like, why don't I turn it back on me and hear Jesus telling me, go and sin no more? And what I would love, I couldn't tell you, if there was on my tombstone, I don't know if there is a better thing that I would want to, somebody to say about me and then live like Jesus and love like Jesus and was a friend. And, and here, so here's the question that I'm asking myself at this time, or at this point in my life. Does anybody say that about me? Would anybody honestly, do I have a reputation where somebody would say, oh, Jeremy, he is a friend of tax collectors. Jeremy, oh, he, Jeremy, yeah, he's a friend of prostitutes. Oh, Jeremy, he's a friend to the homeless. Oh, Jeremy, he is a friend uh, to senior citizens, to widows. I mean, would anybody actually say that about me? Would, oh, Jeremy, he's a friend to minorities, to, to, to people with a criminal record, to kids with special needs. Does anybody, and that's one, that one, that one hits deep. deep. That's convicting. Because it's not that about me saying it about myself. It's does anybody, here's the question I've been asking myself, and then I, through the, I'm at my like, midlife crisis, that the rest of my life, I'm like, does, does anybody, would I ever be earn that reputation of being a friend to the very people that Jesus would want to eat a meal with? He's a friend. Am I a friend? So um, that's just answering last week, and let's uh, jump in. Before we jump in, can we pray together, though? Um, and then we'll jump into the scripture we have today. Uh, Jesus, you are a friend. Um, I think of what David says when I consider the heavens and your hand. Who am I that you would that you'd be mindful of me? And, and who am I that you would even call me friend? Now, Jesus, you're a friend of tax collectors and sinners like me, of Pharisees like me, of and Jesus, thank you for being my friend. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would teach us again this morning through your word what it means to live and love like you. Um, God, I pray that we would t- that you would take off the scales of our eyes, that you would help us see differently this morning. I pray nothing I would do or say would get in the way, God, but help us, Lord, help us, Lord, just to see you and to see others. God, God, open our eyes, heal our eyes this morning. I pray that, our, that your grace would just overwhelm us in a way that maybe it hasn't before. I know it's an audacious ask, God, but would you hit us to the core of who we are? In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Another meal story. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. It says this, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Isn't that cool? Jesus doesn't just have meals with them. He wants to have a meal with them too, or us too, right? Pharisee, uh, if you're ever wondering what the word Pharisee means, it means separated ones. These were religious people that that were defined by how separated they were from anything that would be considered unclean or people that they were considered unclean. We got to keep our distance or whatever. And so this is, Jesus goes from chapter five, he's eating lunch with the tax collectors and the sinners to now he's like, hey, okay, religious person, you want to meet up? Sure, let's do it. Uh, you well-to-do man, sure, let's go have, have a meal. So when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus, he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. He reclined at the table because that's how they would eat. They would eat low to the ground in, in a meal like this. Uh, the table um, actually 
if you it wouldn't look as much like this. It was called a triclonium. It would actually be a U shape, lower to the ground. Uh, you would lean forward and rest on kind of like your leftish side, recline at the table, and you'd use your right hand or right hand to um, eat. Uh, it's uh, there, it's it's the proper way to do it. Um, so if you're ever slouching while you're eating. Mm. Um, now, when you would go to uh, somebody's house, if you were asked uh, as a guest in somebody's home, there are some things that would happen. This happens in, in homes um, uh, all over the place. Uh, this, I'm going to show you a quick picture. This is my favorite human in the entire planet. The one on the left, not the one on the right. That is my bride, my best friend, my teammate, my girlfriend, my lover, my partner, my, um, yeah, I love her, and I don't care if I, you know, I'll just sit here for a minute and just stare at her and tell you how much I love her. Anyway, um, that is my favorite, favorite person, and she is nearly perfect. And if you ever walk into our home, there will be a moment that happens, and I get to watch this moment that happens. See, we grew up uh, in the Midwest, and then we moved to Florida. And there's a certain thing that happens in the Midwest that doesn't happen as much in Florida, but my wife is from the Midwest. And when you enter a home and you walk in, in the Midwest, there's something you do right away. You remove your shoes. When we moved to Florida, I was like, people are walking around their house in their shoes and their flip-flops and their shoes and they're just kind of, I'm like, it was, now, I... I acclimated. It's been 10 years. I'm over it. I've moved on. She has not. <laughs> and so every time she walks in, there's this moment. I told her, I told her, I'm like, you're going you're to be in the sermon this week just because she got after me this week because I was trying to tiptoe in with my shoes to grab something. She's like, <laughs> she likes her floors clean. And so there's always this moment. She's like, are you going to say something? Am I going to say something? And I'm looking over and she's like so excited and wants to welcome people in while she's also hyperventilating. <laughs> it's like, ah... Uh... Now everybody knows if you ever come over to my house, they're like, okay, I got to take off your shoes. Uh, that's not just true in today's world. If you go back in Jesus' day, when you would go into a home, your feet would be dirty because you wouldn't even be wearing Converse or Nikes. You'd be wearing like these leather strap sandals and you've been walking on dirt roads. And so when you come in, your feet are filthy when you walk in. And so one of the things is you would be a guest in somebody's house as you would come in, they would have somebody wash your feet. Um, it was just, it's one of those kind gestures. You walk into somebody's house today, they might be like, oh, hello, give a hug. Come on in, make yourself at home. Can I get you a drink, right? These are pleasant. Okay, oh, let me take your coat. These are things that we often do, right? When somebody comes in as a guest for the first time in our home. In this day, first thing, you would get your feet washed. We want to, um, and, and it was, uh, oh, yes, yeah, let me, let me get your feet washed. So, so one of the servants or one of the kids maybe would come and wash your feet. Second thing, that would always happen, is um, they would put oil on your head. And you're like, okay, we don't do that in my home. But uh, a little anointing oil um, on your head. Olive oil was found everywhere. It was in every home. And they put a little bit on. Well, why? Two things. Um, one, it had a practical purpose. I don't know if you guys know this or not. I'm bald. So my sweet bride, um, I, I, a couple months ago, was in a car crash. And then I replaced my vehicle with a 15-year-old convertible. Miss Jane rode in with me this week. And my sweet bride, ever the thoughtful one, if you go into the side of my car, she put sunscreen in there for the shiny baldness <laughs> as the wind blows my hair around. Um, but you, so, so one that was practical, you know, you're in a desert climate, sun, and so they put a little oil on, just kind of help you just help stay soft. Um, the other, though, was it was a blessing. It was a sign of good times to come. There's joy. Uh, think of Psalm 23. If you've ever read this verse in Psalm 23, and you're like, well, yeah, what is that about? You prepare a table before me. David says about God, God, you've prepared a table for, before me. You anoint my head with oil. It's like a blessing and goodness and joy over. And so that would be uh, the second thing you do. The third thing you would do when somebody would walk in is that you would greet each, each other with a kiss. Um, now, I like greeting my bride with a kiss. Sorry. Um, you would greet each other with a kiss. Uh, we often opt for a holy hug or high five. Although, d depending culturally, there's still several around. Like, sometimes when you gather on Sunday morning, people will, will do a kiss on the cheek. If you've ever been in, um, out of the country, a lot of countries would have, uh, uh, like France, for instance, notorious. You do a kind of an air kiss on the cheek with somebody, right? You put your cheek up next to each other, and it's a pleasant greeting. Um, we 
do that a lot less in America, maybe more hugs or high fives, but it's still somewhat present. Now, those are three things. Now, um, we gather together each week, and when we gather together each week, we intentionally pause during the service to have a time that we have even on the schedule as a meet and greet. We consider it's really actually important to pause and meet and greet and welcome each other. And there's even, like, even the, the act of offering a hug. Like, this isn't, it's not a throwaway moment. It's an important time of our gatherings. And you say, yeah, I'm an introvert. No, no, no. Hear me out for a second. It is an important piece. One, it's actually an imperative in Scripture to greet each other like that and to offer hospitality. It's, it's actually, like, one of the ways we live out our faith. It's actually good for you. Not just good for them, it's good for you. Did you know this? Uh, scientists, uh, family therapist, I forget what her name is. I think I had it in my notes. Um, oh, Virginia Satir, she's a family therapist, said this. We need four hugs a day for survival. We need eight hugs a day for maintenance. And we need 12 hugs a day for growth. Uh, they've done studies, the scientists have done studies on physical touch and hugs and how it affects us. And it helps everything from mental health. It can help cure, um, help cure depression. It, it's a bonding thing. It even affects our heart health by offering a hug. Oh, see, that made me smile. Just lean over and give a hug. Like there's something that, that chemicals are released in your brain in that moment that not only bond you to somebody else, but it's good for your own mental health. A couple years ago, an uh, older gentleman on Sunday morning, got a little bit emotional and, and told me, I, I, he said, I'm so glad we do that. Those, that's the only hug I get all week. And I was like, we will always do that now. He's like, I'll load up on them. And so we intentionally every week pause and we have this time of meeting and greeting each other. Now, we skipped over it earlier. The introverts, a few of them were like, yes. Thank you, Jesus. I'm about to ruin your day. <laughs> so we're gonna meet and greet each other right now but intentionally. And just to make it extra special, and I got to give credit to my buddy Andrew because he threw this out, idea out. We're not just going to have a meet and greet this morning. We are going to have meets and greets this morning. Um, do we have our servers? Uh, so we have some Grace City, official Grace City charcuterie boards. We have <laughs> meets and greets. There is gospel Gouda on there in Holy Havarti. Um, but stand welcome, shake hands, high five, offer a hug. Everybody, this is our meet and greet time. Meet and greet somebody nearby you. Feel free to grab a piece of meat while you're at, and then we'll continue on. Best meet and greet ever. <laughs> Good morning. Hey, brother. Hey, buddy. Good, it's good to see you, my man. What's up, bud? What's up, sir? Gino, the legend, the man, the mystery. <laughs> good morning, lady. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good morning. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Hello, Derek. Hi. I'm sorry I moved too much, but I still love you. It's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, is my drink over here? There it is. In about one minute. How are you, buddy? Good to see you, son. <laughs> All right. All right, all right, all right. All right, we could let this go on all day, but I'm gonna give you 60 seconds, squeeze a couple more hugs in, load up for the week. <laughs> Best meet and greet ever. favorite person. Mm. All right.
right, all right, all right. We can keep welcoming each other later. I have never wrapped up a meet and greet with salami in my mouth. <laughs> it's kind of staying with me more than I expected. All right. <laughs> and we're good. Okay. Luke chapter 7, let's read this story. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, of course he went. He went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. What is not mentioned there? (laughs) There's no foot washing. There's no anointing. There's no greeting. Jesus walks in. He's been invited to the house. He walks in and he's like, okay. And the way it's written, he just kind of goes and sits at the table. Verse 37, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. Now, anytime you're reading a scripture, honestly, New Testament, you see woman sinful life. The implication there is, scholarly assessment is, you're talking about a prostitute, a lady of the night. When she learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, and this is a woman in town. Everybody knows this about her. She's known throughout town. When he found out he was at the Pharisee's house, She came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Picture the scene for a minute. Jesus invited to the house of this Pharisee. He walks in. He goes and he sits down. And you can ask the question if um, she knew he was at the house and she's a prostitute and this is a, a separated one. How was she let in? Uh, one of my friends this week I was processing and said, does, she, does he know she's a prostitute from firsthand experience? As she's in the house? Like they didn't question her and she just walked in? Who knows? And, and it, it wouldn't be atypical that as they're gathered in, around their table that sometimes you'd have some outcasts or some lesser people kind of in the back of the room off to the side. They wouldn't be at the table. They're just coming out there or out in the courtyard. She's not a real invited guest. She's just kind of there. They weren't anticipating. And she comes in and Jesus is there. His feet are still dirty. There's no oil. He hasn't been greeted. She comes in and she has brought with her what? An alabaster jar of perfume. Uh, This is essentially, it's the tool of her trade. And and not only the the alabaster, it's not just a simple jar. This this thing's worth money. It may be the most prized possession she has. And she comes in with this jar. She plans to anoint Jesus, but as she walks in, his feet are still dirty. And you don't just put anoint with this precious perfume feet that are dirty. And so she walks in and and yet the, the seeing Jesus does something so strong inside of her that her tears begin to well up. Not only do her tears begin to well up, if you, if you jump into the original text, this wasn't written in English. It was, our earliest copies are in, are in Greek. And the word there that says uh, her, uh, wet his feet, it's, it's literally the word for rain. As she sees Jesus there, her tears begin to rain down her face. She's been there since before he even arrived because she had heard he was coming. And, and she sees, and the tears begin to fall. Literally, uh, Martin Luther called it heart water, that she will wash his feet. It, and these drips, it rains so much that it's actually starting to loosen the dirt and, and clean his feet off. Now, she doesn't have a towel. She didn't bring a towel. She wasn't planning on washing, washing his feet. That should have already been done, right? Somebody was supposed to do that. And, and so, so with, with, with no towels, what towel am I going to grab? I don't have a towel. She just takes her hair. And then there's some questions in the text of whether or not, like, was her hair already let down when she walked in? Because only a prostitute would do that. Um, or Kenneth Bailey offers this, that if she let her hair down in this moment, that would be something that you would only do on a wedding night. That, that, that a commitment of an I'm all in and everything I have. So at his feet 
washing with the tears raining down her face and her hair, again, one of the things that she'd be objectified by, begins drying his feet. And, and to the point now where she takes that perfume and kissing his feet, instead of kissing him on the cheek like a normal greeting, she's now kissing the very feet of this one, of Jesus, and anointing not his head with oil, but with precious perfume, even his feet. I mean, can you picture the moment? That's, that's no small thing. Just picture the scene. Um, and, and here, at the feet of Jesus, nobody's forcing her or telling her to do this. It just has welled up. Nobody, you don't force raining tears like that. Maybe greatest actor in Hollywood or put some kind of smelling salt. No, this is a pure just response. She's down at his feet. And there's um, other things there, like that alabaster jar with the perfume that may have been the most valuable things that she has now at his feet, literally like everything, I'm all in, it's all yours. And even, even I, not, not in, a, in any inappropriate way, but in the most appropriate way, like I am, I'm, my whole life is yours. Down at your feet, Jesus. My whole life is yours. And kissing his feet is, an, is a fascinating detail too because as she's down there, do you know what the word for worship is in Greek? When you read the word worship in the New Testament, it, the literal translation does not mean my favorite songs. The, the literal translation of the word worship in your New Testament is proskuneo is the, is the Greek word and it means to kiss before. To, to kiss towards, to kiss before, to be down. And, and it's this idea of I, I'm worse, kissing the ground or kissing before somebody. This is adoration and it's worship. In this moment, like you picture this and she's all in. I mean, it's going to cause quite a scene. Uh, Brendan Manning I mentioned last week, I was rereading one of his books. He said that since the day that Jesus first appeared on the scene, we have developed vast theological systems. We've organized worldwide churches. Your TikTok can be filled with it now, right? <laughs> filled libraries with brilliant scholarship. We've engaged in, earth, in every earth-shaking controversy. We've embarked on crusades and reforms and renewals. Yet, he says, there are still precious few with the sufficient folly, just, just foolish enough or crazy enough, to make the crazy mad exchange of everything for Christ. Only a remnant with the confidence to risk everything on the gospel of grace. A mere handful who stumble about with the delirious joy of a man who found the buried treasure. It's so, like, this, this doesn't happen. We've got more Christian music out. We've got more books at every store. You can Amazon it. There's more prof deeper studies and, and, and commentaries. And, but this, this isn't manufactured. This is just raw adoration, worship, surrender, just um, all in. And of course she does. Of course this woman does. Uh, Dorothy Sayers, here's a picture of uh, Dorothy Sayers. She was a playwright. Um, and a theologian. And she writes about this woman and several others in the New Testament. She, was, she, she said, if you notice, it's, uh, the women respond so much because um, they had never met, she had never met a man like this. She had never met a man that would belittle her, that would mock her for being a woman. You know, the, at this time, it was common we gathered in church um, that the guys would gather and be like, thank you, Lord, that I am not a woman. It was a common prayer. Uh, she had never met a man, they, they had never met a man who would mock them for their femininity or demand that they be more feminine. They never, they, she, Sayer says, uh, they had never met a man like this that would, um, every com comment would be uh, either a seduction or trying to take advantage of or objectifying or whatever it is. It's like, no, here's somebody that just loves her. 
is willing to die for her, that offers grace and forgiveness and sees her beyond just her womanhood or her profession or anything else, just sees to the very core, the heart of her. And so she, this is how she responds. In Luke 7, 39, when the Pharisees, Pharisee, excuse me, Simon, Pharisee, again, separated one, who invited him saw this. If you want to, um, if you're brave enough and you want to in your worship guide or your Bible, you want to circle the word this or underline it or star. When, they had, when he had saw this, when he saw this, when he saw this, when he saw this woman who had come in, who had gotten down and washed his feet with tears and, and, and her hair and, and whatever she had um, anointed and kissing his feet, when he saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Does, does he not know who this is? This is the town center. Doesn't, doesn't he know? Um, Thomas Cahill, the... Uh, late scholar and theologian um, observes this about the picture. Again, I'd invite you, picture the scene for a moment. Let it shake you. Uh, use your imagination. Close your eyes if you want to. Picture the scene. Picture Jesus with, with this woman walking in, crashing the party, and, and the speechlessness around as this takes place. And it's not fake. It's raw and real and authentic. Cahill says this, the reason the scene is so shocking is that it is so difficult to imagine such an excessive woman, cheaply painted, her vulgar apparel chosen for the sake of a testing display of her physical endowments, bawling her head off and crawling on her knees to the naked feet of a bishop or a rabbi or whatever religious figure you might choose to imagine. Like, try to picture that. While well, he not only allows her to proceed in full view of a very dignified dinner party, but shows himself to be entirely unembarrassed and even completely comfortable, and that's not the sort of thing you can fake either, with her prolonged and inordinate display. It takes quite some time, after all, to wash the dusty feet of a grown man with one's tears and dry them adequately with one's hair. This was not a quick thing. It's just the room. You can imagine the room as quiet as this one is right now as they wash or watch this take place as she washes, as she rains heart water on his feet and washes his feet with her hair, speechless sobs as she does it. And Simon sees this, and he has a lot he thinks about it. But Jesus has a lot he thinks about it too. Verse 40, Jesus answered him, Hey, Simon, I have something to tell you. <laughs> Buckle up. Tell me, teacher, he said. And Jesus tells him a little parable. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So one person owed 10 times, right? So he forgave the debts of both. Which one of them will love him more? And Simon replied, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Jesus says, bingo. Then he turned toward the woman, verse 44, and said to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her? Do you see this woman? I came into your house, but you didn't give me any water for my feet. But she rained tears on my feet, and she wiped them with her hair. You... Simon, you didn't give me a kiss on the cheek, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't, you didn't put any oil on my head, but she poured out expensive perfume on my feet. It's fascinating if you, uh, if you jump in the, into this again in the, the original text. Um, in your English translations, uh, Jesus says, do you see this woman? But the original text doesn't actually have the word woman. 
It's just that Jesus says, do you see, Simon, hey, 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 do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? And so you can say, like, is he referring to the act or the person? I could argue both. He doesn't feel the need to just be like, this woman, we'll put her in a box. Do you see this prostitute, this woman, this sinner, this whatever? It's like, do you see this person? Or you could argue, do you see this, that she's doing this act of worship, this thing that she is doing? Do you see this? I mentioned a moment ago, the root for, word for worship means to kiss. Like she's kissing his feet. This is an act of worship. Do you see this act of worship from her? He's emphatic in in doing so. Do you see this, Simon? Verse 47, therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. The, The word there for forgiven, just a quick little grammar thing. I know I'm like, yay, grammar. Everybody's like, no, we're done with school. I didn't like grammar when I was in school. I don't wanna help my kids with grammar. But just for fun, It's the perfect, imperative, middle, passive. So perfect tense, imperative, mood, uh, middle, passive voice. What that means is this. You're like, what does that mean? Or not imperative, excuse me, indicative. What it means, the indicative means that this actually happened. Something actually happened. This is fact. It's meant to be taken objective. So when he's, the word forgiven, like something happened. It's objective, it's it's done. The, um, The middle passive is, Something happened to her. She wasn't the actor. She was the one that something happened, it's a fact, to her. In the present tense, or excuse me, the perfect tense, bleh, sorry, perfect tense, indicative, middle passive. One more time, if, you're, if anybody's taking notes. I don't think anybody's going to fact check me on this, but feel free to go jump in and go on a Greek thing. Um, the perfect tense means this, that what happened to her Objectively, what happened to her happened and is still affecting the present. What it means is she was forgiven. It's done. It's completed. It's a fact. It was done to her. She experienced the forgiveness given to her, and it's now affecting her right now. She has been forgiven. And what you're seeing is she has been forgiven. It's done, it's accomplished, but it's affecting her. That result, that consequence is happening now and it's something that was done to her and it's a fact. It's not up for, it's not maybe, it's a fact. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love is shown, but whoever has been forgiven, little loves little. It's funny because she's like, yeah, I know she's got a lot of sin. I'm not denying it. But she understands forgiveness in a way that you don't, Simon. And so because of that, you don't know how, Simon, you don't have a clue on forgiveness. And because of that, you don't know what love looks like. And you don't know what worship looks like. And then, then verse 48, Jesus says to the woman, he finally, he's, he's now honored. Everybody has judged her. Everybody's looked down on her, not just physically, but has looked down on her her reputation, whatever. And Jesus stops and ignores the rest of the room now after, after talking so highly of her and says, oh, your sins are forgiven. They already were. Your sins are forgiven. The other guests, verse 49, the other guests began to say to themselves, who is this that he forgives sins? Answer, Jesus. <laughs> Verse 50, he ignores the rest of the room because he is locked in with her. And Jesus says to the woman, your faith, your trust has saved you. So go in peace. Uh, The word for forgiveness has the root word of like sending away. Like I took all that stuff and it's been sent away. It's already done. I did this for you. I know it's affecting now. Your faith, your trust has saved you. It's done. So as you go out now, as you travel, as you journey, as you walk, as you go forward, go in peace. Forgiveness, salvation, and peace, all given to this woman. This is what's been done to her. This is what she was freely offered. Forgiveness, salvation, and peace. So 
So I want to wrap up. And in some sense, I, I, my man, Scripture just pretty much says it, doesn't it? I want to go back to verse 40, 47 for a second. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. Therefore, I tell you, her sins have been forgiven. How do I know? Because you can see it. She knows what forgiveness looks like. As her great love has shown, Jesus says this, this is what worship looks like. This is what someone who has been forgiven and freed looks like. This is someone who is all in, who has found grace, who has found something worth trading it all for and laying it all down. That's, this is what it looks like. And so the question I would ask myself and I would invite you, Jesus says, do you see this? Do you see this, Simon? The question I would ask myself this morning is, do I love Jesus like this? Do I love Jesus like this? And that's a good question to wrestle with. I might love my sports team like this <laughs> or my whatever club or group or school, political party. Like, like when Notre Dame, not Purdue, but when Notre Dame scores a touchdown, I will jump, squeal, throw my arms in the air, and I don't care how silly I look. When I think about the things that would actually bring me to tears, do I love Jesus like that? Or has it just gotten stale somewhere along the way? Or do I just forget how much I've been forgiven? I'm so consumed judging somebody else. And Jesus says, you see, when Simon saw this, he had all kinds of thoughts, but Jesus said, yeah, but do you see this? Simon saw this, but Jesus saw this, and they saw it very, very differently. Do I love Jesus like this? There's a I'll just leave it at that. I'll give you um, one more final thought. Because the passage is not just about how Simon sees Jesus, is it? I mean, she sees Jesus very different than Simon sees Jesus. Her great love has shown the difference. But the passage is actually also about what? Not just how Simon sees Jesus, but how Simon sees her, right? And yet Jesus uses her as an opportunity to say, hey, there's something for you to learn, Simon, from her. And I've been wrestling with that a lot this week. There's a, there's a scripture, it's in the uh, book of Hebrews, that talks about the importance of offering hospitality to strangers. Uh, Hebrews 13, two, here we go. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. We talk about strangers becoming friends, friends becoming family a lot here. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. The word hospitality, uh, you, we've heard xenophobia. The Greek word there is xenophilia. This means I love the stranger. Don't forget to show hospitality, to love strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Like angels? Like, word angel just means messenger of God. Don't get stuck on the halo and miss the message that the person might actually have. Could you imagine for a second, you say, well, she doesn't seem like an angel to me. But hey, Simon, she's got a message for you if you'll pay attention. She has something to teach you about what worship looks like and forgiveness looks like, Simon. 
And what if those people that we often think are inconveniences in our life or interruptions, the people that we're so quick to tem- and tempted to look down on or distance ourselves from, actually have something to teach us, that God has a message for us through them? What if that kid that processes things differently than you has something to teach you? What if the lady with nothing actually has something to teach you? What if the guy that has the record knows a little bit about forgiveness? Maybe the, maybe the teenager that lifts her hands and sings loud and moves a little more than you are used to? Maybe, and I'm not saying fake things. That's not it. This is real and raw and authentic, but maybe just maybe there's something there. I remember that um, years ago, I was in, in that same middle school basement with a bunch of students gathered around. We're singing songs, and my friend Cameron, she's an eighth grader. I had met her when she was in sixth grade. Her dad was a, a friend of mine. I just had lunch with him, and a couple weeks after that, her dad tragically passed away. And I remember the funeral, the phone call, all that. But then um, just a short time after that, we're singing these songs in a musty basement with middle school students. And I look out and Cameron, um, God love her, she did not have a good singing voice. And I can say that because I don't either. But here's this girl in the middle of a, of a mass of students singing and tears streaming down her eyes, singing at the top of her lungs and whatever key she felt like. I, I remember that night, I set my guitar down, I walked over and I gave her a hug. I said, thank you for teaching me about worship tonight. What if the people in your life that you often skirt past, that those are angels, messengers from God, if you just open your eyes? Uh, we're gonna close um, with communion as we did last week. We're all invited to this table. Our servers will come up and we'll take their spots and we'll worship and continue to do so. Ushers will dismiss you. Um, we'll take a piece of the bread and you can dip it in either the juice or the wine. The lighter's the juice, the darker's the wine. Um, and as we do, just remember that Jesus gave his life for you. He loved you. He invites you Pharisee, sinner, tax collector, wealthy, poor, black, white, red all over. He invites you to his table and take a piece of the bread and you'll be reminded this is Jesus' body was broken for you and his blood was shed for you on the cross. He loved you so much. He died for you. And he welcomes you to come and to remember that again. And I pray this morning as you do that it would change, you would just fall in love with Jesus all over again. It would melt your heart. It would change maybe even the way if you saw him differently, just maybe. And I think think it's true. You might see others differently too. And I keep asking Jesus, fix my eyes, fix my heart. So let's pray and then we'll, we'll share in communion together. Jesus, Savior, King. Thank you. Thank you. I pray you'd soften our hearts. I pray you'd soften mine. And as we stop and remember your sacrifice and your love, thank you for showing that. This woman showed her love, but you showed your love on a cross. We love you in your name we pray. Amen. Let's share in communion together.
Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. And I just want you. And I'm sorry. I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry. When I sing another song, take me back to where it started, and I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I come with my agenda. I'm sorry. Get that you're enough and take me back to where it started. I open up my heart to you. So I'm caught up in your presence, and I just want to see. just want you nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want you nothing else nothing else nothing else will do just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I sing another song take me back to where it started and I open up my heart to you close with one more song of worship and this will be our time for those of us that call Grace City home well um, it's when we give our offerings and um, if you happen to fill out one of those connect cards we'd love to have it we want to know how we can encourage you pray for you get you plugged in if you have questions we'd love to um, help find answers if we don't know the answer we'd love to discover it with you um, uh, but our ushers will bring those around but we'll, let's close out and worship together singing our worship to her. Got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? But I could sing these songs as I often do. 
every song I sing, but you never do. So I throw up my hands. So I throw up my hands and I praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a Thanks so much for gathering with us today. Uh, if you need some hugs or high fives on the way out, I've got plenty. Um, I like stocking up for the whole week too. Uh, don't miss out. We've got our spring fling this afternoon. We've got several getting baptized, including my seven-year-old. Um, so it is a great day. We've got burgers, bounce houses, and a very good time. There's all kinds of stuff going on. So um, with that, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May shine on you. Be gracious to you and may you just fall out his feet in worship. Love you guys. Go in peace.